All righty. So I am somehow tempted to change this discussion to be about Minecraft <laughs> because my six-year-old would be super happy, but I haven't figured out the angle and somehow I could give Aiden some credit CFA, but we'll hold off on that. Um, all right, so back to this whole data thing. Um, so, so I'm gonna start with you, Oliver. Um, so one of the things that I learned in government is there's a big difference between what your executive decision maker could want and often you might have a, a, an analytics question which is about pretty pictures. Show me a nice visualization, show me a chart, show me, God forbid, a pie chart. Um, whereas there's more value in deeper analytics beyond the KPI, deep, meaningful, sort of information that comes from that data. How do you manage that? Hmm. Did you think an easy question? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, I'm the performance management director, mm -hmm. so we've been doing a lot of the KPI work now for the last three or four years. And I think that's kind of where you start. And I had this conversation with Mike Flowers just a little while yeah. ago. I think you start with the simple questions, which is just, what are you doing? How much are you producing? Is what you're producing have any effect? And you do that for a while, and there's a lot of value you can get out of that. And then you get to a point where you might plateau because you've kind of realized all the value you're gonna get out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's where you say, okay, it's time to dig deeper. Let's get into the weeds. Um, you also have to know from the end users really what their problems are, what they're wrestling with. Mm -hmm. And then it's about finding the nice, elegant question where that you can marry nice data sets together to answer that question. So I'd say it's, it's an evolution. Yep. Suda, any thoughts? Um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the tech person. We're, we're very much like the public health response type mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so just knowing, you know, and foodborne disease is just such an unreported illness because so many people get sick and don't ever do anything about it. So it's not, it wasn't hard for us to convince people that this was an important project, you know, and that, you know, there's information out there that we're not harnessing, so. Any, any thoughts, Steph, on the balance between sort of like the pretty visualization and like the deeper analytics from a Google perspective? Mm -hmm. I think we just, we always try to focus on what's the core problem we're trying to solve and what's the most meaningful set of data that'll help us get there, which sometimes can be best presented visually, and we've done a lot of cool visualizations, but sometimes that's just frosting that's not helpful, and we just try to make good choices. Okay, so Suda, going to you, um, you, you know, I think it, it says you've had 15 years in public health. I, I think many of us sort of grew up working with data in a very classical way. Um, you grow up with your classical stats packages, you memorize all the core regressions, all of these things, and then bam, machine learning, all of these non-parametric approaches. How have you seen the evolution of these techniques? You know, clearly you're, you're working on some fascinating things. Merge, uh, move from the classical way of doing things to these different, more modern ways, and how has it changed things? Well, I mean, I think just as we talked about, it's. One of the interesting things is that we find is, especially with like our 311 data, you know, it takes, it's a very interesting person that will pick up the phone and call 311. Um, and, you know, every single person who's calling is calling to complain about something. Whereas when you look at social media data, there's a lot of different things out there. And so people who are posting reviews on a Yelp site are not posting because they're sick. They're just posting because they went to this restaurant. Um, so it's, it's just interesting. It's a different type of user um, or it's a different type of consumer um, that we're getting at, but I think it's a population that we're not getting through our traditional means and that we have to look at because it's a huge portion of the population that we'd be missing. Okay. Any, any further thoughts, Stephanie or Oliver, on that one? You don't want to talk about non-parametric tests? Okay, we'll save that, for, we'll save that for the after party. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, actually. Though. Okay. I think, I mean, long division is still a very, very powerful <laughs> methodology for analysis. And most of what we do is just comparing one number with another okay. number. Um, and then you can do fancy things like correlation analysis. Yep. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't even, I can't even repeat what you just said there. But there's a lot of value to be gained just through long division and cor correlation analysis. 
Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Like there's, you know, it's very easy to talk about all of these advanced techniques, but if you sort of skip the basics, then why, why would you skip ahead? Right. But, so that actually completely contradicts my next question. Um, <laughs> so Stephanie, going, going to you. So Google is certainly one of the leaders in data. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think I've admired them for years. They do remarkably smart things. You know, I was just watching your presentation. Sort of things like Waze just fascinate me. How do we take the lessons and, and sort of the smarts of Google um, and bring them over to the public sector? How do you, how do you bridge that? I think a big part of it is picking the problems you want to solve and starting something small and achievable. So one thing my team worked on, we work on elections and civic engagement. And if you look at our big mission, we want to get more people out to vote. We want better quality voting. We want more people uh, engaged with their governments. And that's a really big mission. But when we set out to try to tackle it, and just answering the question on Google search of where do I vote turned out to be an epically hard question to answer. And so we had to solve the very basic problem first before we s sort of went for our big mission. Mm -hmm. And I think of the same thing, like one of the things I'm obsessed with is traffic and transit and congestion along the lines of ways. And yeah. it's you know, just understanding why traffic and congestion happens could be a basic problem. And that's a lot further away than rerouting the world or controlling all traffic lights. So I think part of what we've done is pick achievable problems and break down problems. And I think anyone in government can do that too. So an area I know we all worry about is pipeline. So a specific topic are data scientists. So you see articles about data scientists being unicorns and all of these yeah. things, um, which getting a little dramatic. Um, but with that being said, a focus of, of code and a focus for you know, many of us is how do we maintain a talent pipeline into government? Mm. Um, and how do we bring that smart new innovation, whether it's a data scientist, art uh, engineer, whatever you have, to say, I want to make a difference. I want to work in Chicago for a couple of years, like Flowers earlier talked about doing a two-year tour. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, in each of your cases, find talent? Because at the end of the day, it's not about the technology, it's about the people who mm -hmm. then apply the technology. So Oliver, what are your approaches here? New Orleans is a very unique place. Um, and people come to New Orleans or return to New Orleans because they want to be a part of the revival of the city. So I think we, uh, it's a unique place in that it's, we have a fecundity of people who are really passionate about making the city a better place. And then they bring different talents to the table. Um, and some of those talents are the analytics folks. Okay, so. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's, you know, we, we have this a great partnership with Columbia and, um, you know, we get students who work on our project and, and then kind of come in and, and continue to work with us. And, and one of the things that I found is that for them, it, they kind of look at us and they're like, wait, no one else is doing this? <laughs> and we're like, no, no one else is doing this. We need for somebody to help us, you know, answer this problem. And for them, you know, I think they find it to be very interesting and exciting, but also something that they can really help us with, you know, that's mm -hmm. maybe not that as hard for them as it would be for someone like me who has no tech background. Okay. I really admire programs like Code for America and the Presidential Innovation Fellow when you can bring mm -hmm. people with private industry experience into government. I would like to figure out how we can scale that. I love that Mikey went over to help with healthcare.gov from Google. How can we scale that? If you meet somebody from Google when you're here in this conference, talk to them about that. So I think that's one piece of it is sort of creating a movement between. And then the other piece of it is just the leaders in government. Like I think you represent somebody who's promoted a, an agenda of civic innovation and entrepreneurship and open standards. And uh, people want to solve hard problems. My team, we had probably a three hour talk on Monday just about potholes. And maybe it's not as sexy as procurement. <laughs> but we still think it was pretty interesting, and there's really, really big, important problems to solve. So I think it's um, the leaders in government creating um, environments for innovation and entrepreneurship. Okay. So potholes are super sexy. Super sexy. Just for, just mm -hmm. for the record. Yep. So earlier, um, my BFF Flowers talked about sort of his illegal conversions. Mm. Um, and while I will criticize Mike for his architectural design, um, it's fine. I'll help him. Um, oh, come on. One laugh. Um, but the illegal conversions is an excellent use case mm. of 
sort of applied analytics using sort of some classical techniques and having a really big sort of outcome. Um, so I'd ask for each of you to sort of, you, you know, these examples illustrate success in what we're trying to do. What other examples do you have? But I'd like to couple that question with what do you see also as our biggest challenge at this point? Um, so why don't, Steph, you've been on the back for a while, so why don't we start with oh, you? Oh, no, I'm still thinking. Okay, then okay. we'll go to Suda. That was a hard question. Because Suda <laughs> said she's ready. Okay, good. <laughs> um, our big, gosh, my, our biggest challenge. Um, I mean, I, for me, I feel like our biggest challenge is procurement. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not it's really, it's, it is, it's fine. It's trying to engage um, the people that are used to doing things a certain way and showing them a new way to do it and convincing them that we need to deal with our firewall issues so we can access the open data, you know, the public data more easily. And, you know, so I think it's really just changing the mindset of mm -hmm. people in government sometimes, at least for me. <laughs> Do you, have a, do you have a success case that you think sort of illustrates, you, you know, where we've really, like the illegal conversion example? Um, yeah, I, you know, I can't think of an example right now. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. okay. Steph is ready. Our biggest, I mean, what I said in my presentation, my biggest fear is that open data and the narrative is going to start to fall on deaf ears because it hasn't realized its potential. And a lot of people are working really hard to put data out in the world and then not good things are coming from it and as Jen said action isn't happening and so people are going to get exhausted before we've even started our journey and so that's my biggest fear and that's why I'm hoping people in this room will help us change that narrative and if I think of success stories I mean I'm a huge fan of GTFS I think that's mm -hmm. one success story about public yep. transit data and then the voter information project is another one I cited which is sort of a combination of Google Pew and a lot of other entities I think which has really changed how we get voting information. Right. Yeah, I, so your, I think your original question was about what are other cases out there kind of like the Mike Flowery's illegal conversion case? And I think all the 311 service areas that different cities have are ripe with those opportunities. And um, 311 is a fantastic tool. It's a fantastic customer service tool. But I think it does set up, I don't think it is motherhood and apple pie policy outcome wise. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of our service requests based on a first in, first come out mm -hmm. basis on those 311 calls, and I think a lot of other cities do that too. But that might uh, be totally divorced on what actually might be the most effective catch basin to clean first, or the most effective mm -hmm. street light to fix first. And that very well might not be the one that got the most complaints. So, as we wind down the clock here, um, we, we have a captive audience. You know, we, we have people here who really care. Um, we, we filled the house. This is being, you know, it's live stream, hashtag CFA Summit. <laughs> a lot of people watching now. So, going around the horn once more, what is your ask of this crowd? What is your sort of call to action? What will make a difference? Um, let's start with Steph to close out. So I think starting with the people you're trying to serve and the issues you're trying to tackle when you think about open data. So open data not for transparency's sake alone, but because we're trying to tackle real issues. So please think about people and issues first, and then think of open always with structured, updated, what's the fourth? Licensed, yay, they listened. <laughs> Structured, updated, and licensed, and let's try to make sure we're focused on much more than just open. Right, Oliver. I, I participate in things like this because I want to learn from other people so I can employ them, employ their successes in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I hope that when people, whatever they're working on, f have uh, keep an eye on the replicability of what they're working on. Uh, and then to document what they do and then share it aggressively and publicly so that we can all borrow from each other. So. Yeah, I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree with both what Steph and Oliver had to say. I mean, I really am so interested in everything that I've learned here today and just seeing all the different projects that the fellows have worked on and, 
you know, thinking about uses that we could we have in New York City and really trying to learn from them and get the get it out there. Great. Well, thank you everyone for some really great lightning talks. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks.